Hello everybody, it's been a while since my last videos. I've been on holiday enjoying myself and have just finished playing at the British Championships in Bournemouth this year. It was a very nice sort of mini holiday I had. And I thought I would show some games from my own uh, tournament as well as the uh, the main feature of the Grandmaster Games in the main British Championship Championship section. But first off, I'll show a game of mine. This game was quite interesting because it was the first game I had played for two months in a rated, over-the-board, standard play match. So I felt like I was a little bit out of practice. And I was white, playing Reinhard Schmowitz, who is rated about 160 ECF, or the mid-1800s FIDE, and I'm around 2100. So I thought I should win, but again, the whole out-of-practice thing was, was in my head. So I was a bit nervous going into this game. I started off with uh, something uncharacteristic, E4. Thought I'd play mainline things rather than my usual English opening. He replied with the Sicilian C5. And after he played this, I thought I would just play the mainline book openings, and that way I don't need to feel nervous about steering off course very, very early on. Nice F3. Then D6, it's the main line Sicilian, D4, and as is usual, when white has two pawns in the centre on E4 and D4, if black can, they should capture. So that's exactly what he did. And I could play a little bit eccentrically and take with the queen, and after knight C6 tacking my queen, I could pin it with bishop B5, but... I played the main line, knight takes d4. And now knight f6, preventing white playing pawn to c4, uh, having complete control over the d5 square. This more or less forces the reply knight to c3. And here black has loads of options. So at this point... For me, I don't know enough theory to really uh, be comfortable from this position. So I have to think uh, for myself at this point. He played knight c6, which is which is popular. Uh, a6 is, I think, maybe slightly uh, more often uh, the case. Uh, it's more played more often than knight c6. But uh, at my level, usually... Uh, e6 or g6 is played, so I haven't really uh, encountered knight c6 before. I thought about bishop b5 pinning the knight, but instead I opted for bishop c4. I remember seeing Bobby Fischer play several games against the Sicilian, where bishop c4 worked out very well because it targets the weak pawn on f7, and there are usually sacrifices in uh, those sort of games. Uh, here, e6 is popular. a6, also noteworthy. But instead, queen b6 was played. And this creates a few annoying threats. The queen is attacking the knight on d4. So that's my immediate concern. And... Can you see what's wrong with me playing bishop e3, trying to create a discovered attack on the black queen? You can pause the video if you want, or I'll reveal the answer in a few seconds. Well, if I play bishop e3, then that means the b2 pawn is now no longer protected, and the queen could take it. So I didn't really like the look of that position. It may be playable, but 
my again my knowledge of the opening does not really go that far perhaps knight b4 is possible uh, sorry knight b5 is possible here but then there are moves like queen b4 and it gets very very complicated so instead i thought i'd seen this position once or twice before and i'll be impressed if you know the main move it's actually knight b3 but i was feeling more aggressive and i played knight on d4 to uh b5 but first knight b3 is the main move and Usually what happens is black plays e6, letting out the dark squared bishop, and controlling a, a little bit more of the centre. Uh, I would probably castle. Then bishop e7, preparing to castle for black. And at this point, I think attacking the queen with bishop e3 is now the right thing to do. Queen will almost certainly drop back to c7. And perhaps here might be the right time for white to expand in the center with f4. And when white is uh, playing the Sicilian, generally white uses the pawns on the king side to gain space and create an attack. Black will do the same on the queen side. So a logical move here for black would be a6 preparing b5, attacking the bishop on c4. After the bishop moves back, black would then be able to play bishop b7, finketering the bishop and finishing the development of the minor pieces. And then after black castles queenside, black has completed development. So this could well have happened if I had played the main line. If we go back to the position after queen b6 uh, as i said i chose knight db5 uh, because knight b5 sometimes is quite a good move it's quite strong uh, when black has not yet played pawn to a6 there's lingering threats of knight c7 check forking the king and rook and usually having a knight in the opponent's half can be very annoying and it cramps their position makes it hard for them to coordinate their pieces. So he played the very good move a6. And I then looked at the position and I hadn't really calculated. I was just on autopilot uh, at this point in the game. And I realized that knight a3 is not a very desirable square for my uh, pieces to go. And I really didn't like the idea of playing knight a4. Uh, and after the queen moves, I would then have to put my knight on uh, on b5 to probably back to, c uh, to d4. Uh, and I just felt I was moving my knights a lot and I wasn't really achieving much. So I thought, ooh, I can attack the queen. Bishop e3. Then he played the move I didn't see, queen a5, pinning my knight on c3. And now he is definitely going to take the b5 knight if I don't respond to his threat. So again, knight a3 is terrible. I'll put it on d4. And what do you think black played here? It's a move, again, I hadn't seen this move. Okay, the move black played was knight takes e4. Because my knight on c3 is pinned. If the knight on c3 moves, the queen on a5 will then, uh, well, be able to capture the king. So I'm not able to capture his knight. And I've lost a pawn. So at this point, black is is definitely in a better position. Perhaps not completely winning yet, but well on the way. I then played a subpar move, but the computer gives queen f3 as being an interesting 
uh, option for, for white. And it does actually think that perhaps white does have enough compensation for the pawn or will be able to win it back fairly quickly. And I didn't play this move because of f5. But first, the knight on e3 can obviously take white's knight on c3, and I don't think I'm able to capture it after queen takes c3, the queen's attacking everything. But I do have knight takes the other knight on c6, attacking black's queen. And perhaps uh, taking the knight with the pawn is not the best move, because if black does it, then white has queen takes c6, and here black loses, because if king d8, can you see what happens after king d8? Yeah, after black moves the king to d8, you can see that the king and the queen are on the same diagonal line. So bishop b6 would win for white, would win the queen. But the alternative isn't very good either. Bishop d7, queen grabs the free rook. And the only way to avoid mate is queen d8. And here, if you're really mean, you could play bishop takes f7 check, which would uh, lose the queen for black. But if I was playing, I'd probably be more boring and play queen takes queen, king takes, pawn takes knight, and I'm just a rook up here. So I would ass I'd assume my opponent would resign in this position. So... That's why knight takes knight on c3 is not possible. But after f5, again, I should have analysed further, but here I just stopped looking at the moves because I thought there wasn't really any counterplay for me. However, I can take the knight again on c6. Pawn takes knight. And after I castle queenside... It's a rather difficult position for black to play. Uh, black hasn't developed and can't castle, so that's a, a point in my favour. And also, black's pieces aren't that well uh, coordinated, mostly due to uh, development problems. So here, uh, white definitely has compensation for the pawn. White's pieces are very well developed and coordinated. And there could be a devastating attack being launched very soon. A possible line from this point is rook b8, trying to activate the rook. Knight takes knight, pawn recaptures. Bishop check first, just to prevent the king ever being able to castle. King d8. And after queen takes e4, this is probably... I'd say better for white. Maybe not completely won, but probably white's got about an extra pawn, according to the computer. That would be my guess. Because black still isn't able to move the f8 bishop, and therefore the h8 rook. So it's almost as though black is playing two pieces down for the next couple of moves. And that's how I think of it in my head. So this was definitely a line I should have looked at more, and should have really gone into. But instead of the queen f3 line, which uh, in retrospect makes the most sense, I instead played knight on d4 to b3. And the thinking behind this was that if the queen moves and uh, doesn't pin the c3 knight anymore, then perhaps I can take advantage of Black's loose knight on e4. Maybe I can take it for free. Maybe uh, I can attack it enough that uh, black is forced to make some sort of concession. And also the idea of attacking things, such as the queen, is in my nature, really. I like, I like attacking loose pieces. But here, 
black can uh, counterattack with the very strong knight takes c3, a Zwischenzerg. So this is uh, an in-between move. Instead of moving the queen out of the way, black takes a piece and attacks my queen. And I did see this after I played knight b3. My thinking now is to play queen d3, getting my queen out of the attack, and I'm still attacking black's queen. Therefore, he can't save his c3 knight. Queen e5. Now I would capture with the pawn, because I, I need to keep the queens on to try and create an attack and get compensation for my lost pawn. Bishop f5. Queen d2. And after perhaps g6, trying to activate the f8 bishop, I could castle bishop g7. And here, I hate my position. I have three isolated pawns, three pawn islands, and obviously a doubled, uh, set of doubled pawns. So my pawn structure is a shambles, it's a mess. <laughs> Uh, and my pieces just aren't active enough, really, to uh, claim any sort of advantage. The only thing working is, after perhaps knight d4, I might be able to get a little bit more central control. Uh, and black's queen is easier to attack, and the king hasn't yet castled. So I would say that black is not up a full pawn, uh, I, white has a tiny bit of compensation for it, but black is still winning. Uh, and this was the kind of position that I hate having, but I feel that because my opponent is not as highly rated as I am, uh, I could perhaps rely on my superior technique to be able to manoeuvre into a more favourable uh, middle game or an end game later on uh, from this point. But it's still not the position that I would wish for. However, here he did not play knight takes knight. He instead played the move queen b4. So this is also a logical move. It attacks my bishop on c4, keeps the pin on my knight, and just gets the queen out of danger. So I now have to address the uh, weak hanging uh, bishop on c4. One move I could play is uh, queen e2, defending everything, but then my knight on c3 is being attacked and, and things get messy. There's queen d3, also uh, not perhaps the best move. Black can swap off a bit of material, I think. Uh... There's also, well, there's also moving the bishop to d3 or e2, but again, that's very passive. And if I let black, to, if I let black take control in this position, then I'm hardly gaining any compensation for my lost pawn. So instead, I decided that I was going to win the pawn back. Uh, so, pause the video if you want to try and find out on your own. How does white win back the pawn by force? Okay, well, forcing moves, so I kind of gave you a clue there. The move is bishop takes f7. So, a forcing move, in my, uh, in my opinion, is not only a capture or a check in this case that's both it's both of them it's also uh, a checkmate threat or maybe attacking a very powerful piece like the queen and that forces the opponent to respond to it so a check and a capture by their nature almost always force a certain response so here black only has three legal moves and I think two of them you can just dismiss. If the king does not take the bishop, uh, then I've just uh, made black forfeit castling rights without any kind of compensation for it. And if black does play king d8, I might be able just to play uh, 
maybe uh, castles, perhaps. And I would actually think white stands a little better. Instead, he did take my bishop. And now, can you see the only way that I can win back the piece? Yeah, queen f3 does not work because knight f6, blocking the check, saving the piece. So instead, queen d5. And there's no way black can protect the knight on e4. So bishop e6 was played, developing. Queen takes e4. And here my opponent opted to swap the queens. And that is an interesting choice. Uh, I think it's the best move because the king on f7 is now never going to be able to castle and will have a very rough time if the queens are on the board. It'll be susceptible to lots of checks and uh, it'll be far more likely that the black king will get checkmated before the end of the game than my king, which can still get to safety by castling. So removing the queens is good. And at this point, look at white's pawn structure. All six pawns on the board are unmoved. So this is more or less a perfect pawn structure. And if you get to the end game, generally the pawns on the side of the board are better than pawns in the centre because uh, pawns on the side are generally harder to stop from uh, promoting if they're a passed pawn. Knights especially have lots of problems with pawns on the very edge of the board, the A pawns and the H pawns, whereas pawns in the centre are very easy to attack late on in the game. And if you look at Black's pawn structure, it's not as good. Admittedly, there aren't many pawns that have moved, but Black has three pawn islands, a7, a6 and b7 form an, a little island of pawns, d, d6 and e7, another one, and finally g7 and h7. And the more islands you have, more little groups or clusters of pawns, generally the weaker your pawn structure is. And white has two pawn islands that are more or less perfect. So white's pawn structure is better, but black's pieces might be slightly better in the long term. Because uh, the centre is fairly open, there aren't clusters of pawns just preventing the enemy pawns from moving, that means that bishops are going to be a little bit better than knights. Or if, if black was an extremely good player, usually he could craft the endgame and manoeuvre it into a position where bishops would be better. And black has two bishops, white only has one. So my plan is to play knight g5 check, and then I would capture the bishop. And therefore black's only uh, advantage, only plus, would be removed, and white would stand better due to the pawn. So my opponent played h6, very good move, preventing knight g5. And I decided that I was going to connect the rooks. And even though the queens are still off, I'm a little bit nervous about my king. So I castled. And here my opponent made a big mistake. He needs to get the bishop on f8 working. He needs to get it developed and therefore connect the rooks. So what do you think the best move for black is in this position? Well, it's going to take you quite a while to get the bishop working on the a3 to f8 diagonal. So instead, why not finchetto it? The best move is g6, which allows bishop g7. And I'm struggling to really find a good way of attacking black. Perhaps I could play rook a d1 to put my rook on a semi-open file. Instead, though, he played g5 which on the surface doesn't look like it really changes much. It gains a little bit of space, doesn't it? So some of you might think this is better. But this allows what's called a pawn break, where, uh, where one side has a space advantage with the pawns. Black has just gained the space advantage with g5. 
And a pawn break is when the other side, in this case white, plays a pawn move that challenges, that attacks that pawn and threatens to break up their structure. So my move was f4. And here, this is a little bit uncomfortable for black. The threat immediately is f takes g5, discovered check, winning a pawn. And if the black king moves, then I can still take on g5 and win a pawn. So if black takes it, I would capture with the rook check, and then perhaps move my a1 rook to the f file. So I'd have double rooks on the f file, and black would still have not connected the rooks and finished development. So that would be a great position for me. He chose the quieter g4, which does put his pawn in my half of the board, but I'm not sure that pawn is really going to be more of an asset than it is going to be a liability. I do the same, but I feel that my pawn is very powerful now. f5. And that gives my bishop some more squares to directly control. It threatens to push f6, which would make my pawn very powerful. And if black moved his e-pawn up, the pawn would be a passed pawn and could wreak havoc. And if black ever takes it with his e-pawn, then his d-pawn his d would be isolated. So not very nice. And he also has to deal with the immediate threat of pawn takes bishop. Bishop d5. And again, I don't want his bishops to be on the board forever, and especially if there are lots of pawn exchanges and rook exchanges. So the quicker I can get rid of his bishop, the better. Knight c3. And finally, he decides that he's going to capture my knight with his bishop, giving up his bishop pair, and inflicting what he thinks is a slight weakness in my pawn structure. I capture, capture towards the centre with my pawns. So A takes. The A pawn is now closer to the centre as it's on the B file. And yes, OK, my pawn structure is now not entirely perfect on the queen's side. But my rook on a1 is now so much more active. It's controlling almost double the squares that it was controlling previously. And I may be able to attack things along the a-file. After a takes, he finally connects the rooks with bishop, D se uh, bishop g7. And black has completed development. Bishop's quite good being finkessoed. So his bishop might be slightly better than mine, but I reiterate my pawn structure is stronger. So I thought here that the position may have been fairly even. But this, will, this brings us to the reason I'm showing you this game from my tournament, because I'm not going to show every game. Some of them are very, very boring. This game is interesting because in late middle games and end games particularly, the pawns are some of the most important features of the position. And here, what I'm trying to do is weaken Black's pawn structure by making him make pawn moves, and also attack weak pawns. So what's the weakest pawn on the board that, uh, for Black? Well, the weakest is g4, because it's already in my half, so it's easy to attack, and it's not being defended by anything. So rook a4 is a very logical move. My rook's now incredibly active, and it's attacking g4. And this more or less forces h5, defending the pawn. And now I've created another weakness. h6 was making my bishop on e3, uh, it was making it impossible to move to g5. Now my bishop can move to g5, so maybe I could attack the e7 pawn, which is a backward pawn. So, first off, I play knight d5, putting my knight in the centre, and targeting e7. So I'm starting to, to bring my pieces over and attack another weak pawn. 
backward pawns, isolated pawns, unprotected pawns, and uh, sometimes doubled pawns are my favourite targets. They're generally the weakest pawns. And here, black has an interesting choice, which he didn't choose to do. He played bishop e5 in the game. But can you see what is wrong with bishop takes b2, grabbing the pawn? Okay, again, pause the video if you want to work it out for yourself. I'll reveal the answer in a couple of seconds. All right, well, the bishop on b2, kind of creating a finchetto on the other side of the board, uh, is not the best square for this bishop because I can lock it in with c3. Now the bishop has no squares to move to, and I thought here it would be easy to trap the bishop with a move like rook a2. Uh, of course, trust the computer to come up with one of the most difficult lines possible. Rook hc8 is the best move, apparently. And here, rook f2 is a good move, attacking the rook, attacking the bishop. b5. And now, if I play rook a2, black actually can save the bishop with the very complicated bishop takes c3, knight takes bishop, and then knight b4 from black, attacking my rook on a2 and my knight that is now on c3 with the rook on c8. It's so very difficult. So instead, rook e4, bishop a3, attack again with rook a2, bishop c5, and here bishop takes, pawn takes, and knight b6, winning the exchange by force. If black plays, say, king f6, I can leave the capturing of the rook until the next move with rook f2, and just safeguard my pawn. Rook b8, takes, takes. And here this is a winning endgame for white. The Weak pawns that black has, h5, e7, c5, they will, one of them at least, will be able to be captured by white's rooks. And uh, a knight is probably not that good a piece to have in this sort of endgame. I think a bishop would give black better chances of saving the game and drawing. So, after bishop takes b2, even if my opponent played like a grandmaster and saw all that, he would still lose at least the exchange. So he played bishop e5, which centralizes the bishop, and I think is, is a good move, because I could always have threatened f6 when his bishop was still on g7, and that would lock in his bishop on g7 if he took with the pawn. And active pieces are needed in an endgame. So c3, Just I'm just making sure that I don't blunder and uh, give up the b2 pawn for nothing. And also it controls the d4 square, where perhaps later on he might have been able to play knight d4 if I wasn't careful. So at this point, after rook h g8, protecting his g4 pawn... I now play rook e4. So again, I'm concentrating my forces on the e7 pawn and the e7 square. So he still needs to watch out for that. And also, his rook on h8 was guarding the pawn on h5. Now that pawn's not being defended anymore. After rook a c8 which improves his other rook, I play the move knight f4. And it's going to be really difficult for trying to protect that pawn. Rook h8 is not desirable because of knight g6, uh, infiltrating and, again, attacking more and more squares and pieces. Uh, rook g5 just walks into the discovered check after my knight moves. And... Playing h4 just weakens both his pawns a little bit there. Knight g6 again might be the best move. So instead, he took my knight. 
and I recaptured with the bishop. So now I was very, very happy. Again, it's an open position. So even if my f5 pawn vanishes and his e7 pawn leaves the board, he'll still have the weak d pawn and the centre will be open. So there'll be activity on both sides of the board. My bishop will be the stronger minor piece. His knight will be hard-pressed to match my bishop. So he then decided to set up his pieces for the next game with knight b8. Uh, I think the idea was to bring it around to f6 via d7. So I double the rooks. Again, e7 is the target. Rook g to e8, defending. And finally, I infiltrate with my rooks. So here the idea is rook h6, attacking the h-pawn from behind. Usually if you attack the pawn from behind with the rook, then uh, you've, you've done a good job. You've got a good positional uh, edge. Knight d7. So the knight could defend the pawn with knight f6 in a moment. And at this point I decide that I will just make sure that black can't activate pieces. So my f5 pawn is the only one that is easy for black to attack. And the idea could be rook c5 attacking my pawn. And again, it's hard for me to defend it. So b4 just prevents rook c5 from occurring. Also, knight c5 might have been a good square for black's knight, and now it's no longer possible. Knight f6. And bishop g5. So here, I had calculated that if we give black a fairly, uh, fairly unimportant move, let's say b6, I could probably win the endgame with bishop takes knight and black would have to take back to avoid being a piece down. And generally what you should always calculate is going to a king and pawn endgame if it's possible. Because king and pawn endgames are all about calculation really. Uh, you can't then get away with and get lots of compensation if you've got to a king and pawn endgame and realise that you're losing. Uh, this is the final stage of the game. And here I can win in a couple of ways. I could use my king, put it on f2, and I could put my king on g3, then on h4, and then capture on h5. So black would have to can only really prevent this with king f7. After king g3, king g7, uh, and then if I play king h4, king h6. But here I could maybe play king f4, king f7, uh, and if nothing else, I could probably win on tempo. After I put my king on d5, king d7, if black's king ever moves, I will be able to go to either c6 or to e6. And I can run black out of moves. Pawn g3. And black probably doesn't want to trade pawns here. I'm doubling my pawns. So b5. And then I have the last move of b3. Now black is completely lost. If the king goes to e7, king c6, then king b6, king takes a6, king takes b5. And if king c7, then king e6, king takes f6, king g7, and then I can put my pawn on f5 all the way to f8 without interference. So this is a winning endgame for me. And this is what black has to calculate. And the time control for this game was 90 minutes for the uh, full match, uh, plus 30 seconds increment from the beginning until the end. So we had quite a lot of time on our clocks to think about this. That's why he chose knight g8. Again, he's trying to set up his pieces. 
And at this point, I thought, OK, I'm tying black down to that E7 pawn. It has to be protected at all times by three pieces. And I can't really see a way of manoeuvring one of my rooks to attack the B7 pawn. So there's only one pawn that's not being defended that, that I haven't yet attacked. And that pawn is h5. So I use my last piece, the king, to go after the h5 pawn. After king f2, d5 was played. I think here he saw he was getting a bit desperate and was trying to create some sort of counterplay. King g3, rook c6. So now he's attempting to trade off his inactive pieces for my very coordinated and very active pieces. And here I wasn't that concerned. I thought that surely my king taking his pawns would be good enough to win. But perhaps I maybe should have been a little bit more cautious. King h4 takes and rook takes, activating the rook. Rook d8 and king, oh no, no, sorry, rook b6 first. So I just wanted to attack his last weak pawn, rook d7. And yes, here was the point I took the h5 pawn. So I'm now a pawn up. And he played a move I didn't see, d4. I'd forgotten that uh, past the point of him playing d5 was to push one of his pawns. Here I probably should take the pawn on g4 with my king. And if he plays d3, I can always play bishop d2, blockading the pawn, and I'll probably be able to win it back uh, not win it back, win the pawn by playing king f3, king e3, and then manoeuvring my rook to attack the pawn as well. But I just didn't like the idea of him having a passed pawn. I took, rook takes, rook takes b7. So at this point I was thinking that I was two pawns up and therefore must be winning. But the problem is, I'm not really two pawns up, I'm one pawn up and a little bit. Because doubled isolated pawns, I don't really consider them uh, worth two pawns. I consider them like one pawn and a little bit extra. So knight f6, check. Activating the knight, and I swapped. King takes. And I thought that, okay, I've reached a rook and pawn endgame uh, a pawn up plus plus tax, and I should probably win. But uh, there is a saying: all rook and pawn end games are draws. That's not really true, but it does speak to the fact that lots of rook and pawn end games have drawing tendencies. So I needed to be very careful. I played b5, trying to swap off pawns, and then not having doubled isolated pawns anymore. And here he missed the chance to draw. Can you see what black could have played to try and draw the game? The move is a5, which keeps my pawns doubled and isolated. And his move in a moment is going to be rook b4, attacking both my pawns. He'll win one of them back, and also uh, my rook is not going to be that good because my rook's in front of my pawn. It's it's uh, impeding the progress of my b5 pawn. So after b6, rook b4, I might have to play a move like g3 because there's not a lot else I can do. King takes f5, rook takes e7. Uh, and now I lose one pawn, and it's already practically drawn. Rook g7, rook takes b2, check. Rook takes pawn, rook takes check. And I stay a pawn up, but this endgame, I think, is completely drawn, if black can uh, play fairly well here. Uh, generally, all black needs to do is keep the rook where it is and keep his king near the promotion square of g8. 
and it's practically impossible uh, for me to me to win as long as the rook on as long as his rook can keep checking my king and stopping me making any progress so that was a bit of a mishandling of the end game by me uh, and he really should have taken his chance here it would have been great for him to get so many raising points instead he took my pawn because Generally, when you're down on material, if you trade pawns, not pieces, uh, then you decrease the likelihood that your opponent is going to win one of your pawns for nothing and use one of his or her own pawns for uh, promotion. So if he can remove all the pawns from the board, say for maybe one, as we saw in the previous uh, example, then it's basically a draw. So right idea, but the wrong time to exchange pawns. Now I'm defending b2 and f5, and here I'm confident that I can win. Rook f4, and at this point, would you play g3 attacking his rook, or king h4? Again, pause the video, because if you want to try and work it out, because it is quite a long sequence of moves. All right, well, it's a bit of a trick question. They both win, uh, but at the time I thought one of them was a draw. G3 was what I, th I thought was a draw at this point, because I saw rook takes f5 check, takes, takes, b4, e5. And here, there's no way that white can prevent the e-pawn queening. And if it's just a queen and two pawns against a queen and one pawn, it should really be a draw. But I missed a key move. After we both chuck our pawns up the board, I promote first, which is very important. Queen e1. Can you see the winning move for white? Queen f4 is one move which would win the g-pawn so yeah that that's that's good you would win if you played it correctly a queen and two pawns uh, a queen and two pawns against a queen but the much easier win is queen f8 check king is forced onto the e-file and then skewer queen e7 or queen e8 check and black loses the queen and here it's game over. It's, I would guess it's mate in about four moves, but I haven't analysed the position from here. I just thought game over. So I missed that key move. I stopped analysing when we both promoted. And that, one of the key features of, uh, uh, of chess is to always try and analyse one move further than you think is necessary. So... I played king h4 because of what happened in the game. Rook takes f5, and I calculated I would win the king and pawn endgame. So, to make the game easier, trade rooks. And here, b4 wins, because if black now uses the king to prevent my b-pawn queening, then he's, he's deflected, he's taken away from the action on the king side. So I can take the g4 pawn with my king and either push my h pawn all the way to the end of the board and win that way, or also use my king to capture his e7 pawn while his king is preoccupied with my b pawn, and then chuck my uh, pawns up the board and win. So he played e5, trying to uh, go into a queen and pawn endgame, b5. And this is his last chance to catch my pawn with king e6, e4. So he's chosen to use his pawn. b6. Now his king cannot catch the pawn. His king uh, is just too far away. So he played e3. And now what's the easiest winning move for white? All right, well, 
again, you could play b7 and b8 queen and go into a complicated queen and pawn endgame. But instead, I played king g3. Now, the king is close enough to stop black's pawn promoting, but black isn't near enough to stop my pawn promoting. And after king e4, b7, my opponent resigned, because if he plays e2, I play king f2, e2, king f2, and if king d3, b8, queen is the the correct move, but what I could do just to try and induce resignation is play king e1. And now there's no way in the world that black is going to get that e pawn to queen. And here I would be shocked if he didn't resign, because after any move, king e3 for example, I then play b8 equals queen and and win. So that was uh, that was my first game of the tournament, and I was happy to to win it. Uh, and I've hoped you've enjoyed this video on on primarily attacking a lot of pawns in the middle game and end game. So comment, like, subscribe, and see you next time. Okay, bye.